Um, this is just a general question. It it's not a, based on anything. Um, what was your favorite storyline to write about in Dead House Gates? And did you already know the end, which I think you kind of alluded to that you did when you started writing it? Oh, the favorite storyline by far was Felicity's. I have a feeling you'd say that. <laughs> nice. Same. Hello, kiddos. Hope you're all having a wonderful day. Unfortunately, though, the topic I would like to discuss today is a bit of a heavy one. I always find it a bit ironic, or perhaps tragic, that the series overall is about compassion, and yet there's a severe lack of compassion directed at Felicity. Especially since she is the perfect example of why compassion is important. Now, I'm not trying to say that anyone who dislikes Felicin is wrong. In fact, most people feel that way since she is an unlikable character. She is an abuse victim who did not have any support and thus lashes out at everyone just to feel a little bit of power and control. She is definitely not nice with her words, but does that mean she deserves to be hated? I say no, but not everybody feels that way. So for Felicin, um the only thing I had as, as a base notion was that she's going to be a survivor. And um, that survival is going to require uh, immense sacrifices on her part. Um, and then there's going to be the physical side of things where um, with enough trauma, uh, an individual will seek to basically um, numb themselves in some fashion or another. Uh, to disconnect. Um, uh, my, I mean, my father was a psychologist, so I, I, I got a lot of psychology uh, stuff going on when I was growing up. And um, so in, in terms of sort of being consistent with the character, uh, I guess one applies all of these things um, and making sure that uh, it just feels real. Um, as for the reader response to Felicity, and that was quite extraordinary. I was quite surprised. Um, at how many readers just despised her and um, and simply uh, called her names and, and you know for, for the choices she made and, and the fact that quite often whenever she's speaking um, there is so much going on underneath the the surface of the language that, that's being spoken that um, you know every time she lashed out as a writer my heart would break but for the reader they only saw the lashing out. And so um, it, it was quite surprising to, to, to see that kind of um, dismissive response to, to a character who basically was doing everything she could to, to survive. I'm not trying to defend her from those who dislike her, nor even those who dislike reading her sections. They can be very frustrating, especially if you don't care for the character. No, instead, I'm making this defense against the section of the community that resolutely hates her as a person and even wishes for her death. Hopefully I'll show that while Felicin does say hurtful things, she is a strong and kind person even after all of the horrible things she goes through. On one final note, I'm not very kind to Haboric or Bowden in this video, but please don't think I hate them by any means. It's a terrible situation all around, they are all broken, and I can't blame them for trying to help themselves. First of all, who is Felicin? She's the youngest daughter of the noble Paran family, and lived a carefree life of moderate luxury. According to Gnaus, her older brother, she would always have a wide smile and dancing eyes, and Tavor, her older sister, described her as too soft for this world. So, Basically, a kind and sheltered child who adored her older brother, but was never able to connect with her stoic sister. Unfortunately for Felicin, she would have to harden up very quickly. All is not well inside the Empire. <laughs> I feel like I say that quite a bit during these videos. Corruption among the nobility is at an all-time high, and with one arm's host turning renegade, there was a lot of fear growing among the populace. One of the most tried and true methods of putting a large population at ease is to create a scapegoat and get rid of it. Due to the corruption and general animosity between commoners and nobles, mostly from wealth inequality, the nobles were an easy target, so Empress Lucene decided to kill off a bunch of them. House Paran had especially fallen out of favor, partially due to Gnaus being a member of the renegade army of Dujic One Arm. Tavor has taken over as the head of the family due to her father's failing health, 
and in an attempt to gain power and keep the family in high standing, she becomes the adjunct to Empress Lacine. The price for getting this position was a steep cost. In order to prove her loyalty to the Empress, Tavor would have to personally lead the cull of nobility in Unta. This included arresting and executing her parents, and condemning her little sister to slavery on Otaduril Island. Which is arguably a better fate than what happened to the other noble girls once the mobs ran wild in the district. With all that out of the way, let's get to the tragic things that happened to Felicen. This is going to get a bit graphic, there are a lot of horrible things that happened to this child, especially ones we don't directly see. I'm giving a trigger warning here because, even though I'm not going to be descriptive, it can be very upsetting. If you want to skip this discussion, I'll leave a summary near the end. First of all, she was 14 when her parents were arrested and executed, and afterwards, she was also arrested, pulled out of the noble quarter in the midst of riots, guards were being killed, and noble women were being raped and killed. Numb to the world around her, Felicen was chained in a line with 300 other slaves. Chained next to her was an old ex-priest named Taboric, and a large brute of a man named Bowden. There wasn't much in a way of conversation, but they learned that Felicen was the younger sister of the adjunct, and made a joke about this being a sisterly spat. Of course, Felicen already knew of this betrayal, and we see the sheer hatred she feels towards her sister. The horrifying march to the slave ships would solidify a bond between these three from a shared hardship. The mob lining the route threw stones and bricks, and kept getting past the soldiers to attack the slaves. Bowden saves the day by sawing off the head of the old noblewoman in front of him, scarring Felicen further, but satiating the bloodlust of the mob. I guess the brutality of it threw them off. Less than one-third of the original slaves made it to the ships, and all of them bore wounds. During this trip, Felicen decides that she will do whatever it takes in order to survive and try getting revenge. On the slave ship, Felicen learned that she could sell her body to the guards to get her group more food and positioned out of the sewage. I'm not sure how much everyone knows about slave ships, but holy shit, conditions were awful on them. Here's an example of the slave ship Brooks, which, after the Slave Trade Act of 1788, could carry 454 slaves packed in like sardines. Before the act, it would carry up to 609. Chained down and forced to lay in their own piss and shit, an average of 15% of slaves died due to unhygienic conditions, dehydration, disease, and scurvy. If it was a particularly bad trip, up to a third would die, and this was with mostly the young and strong, not even taking into account old people. Now, the slave ship that Felicen, Bowden, and Haboric were on would probably not be as bad as the transatlantic slave ships. However, based on the descriptions, it wasn't that much better. Felicen and Bowden were both young, so they have pretty decent odds, but Haboric is an old man with no hands. Without Felicen selling her body, there is a very strong chance that Haboric would have died on the ships. Neither Bowden nor Haboric thank her, though they reap the benefits, and in fact, Haboric judges her for it, making her feel ashamed. We next see Felicen being used by a man named Beneth at the slave camp called Skullcup. Beneth is in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of the slaves, and while he is a slave himself, he does have a lot of sway for jobs and food. We also see Beneth begin manipulating Felicen. She sold her body to him to help herself, of course, but another factor was to get Taboric easier jobs and more food, since pulling carts would kill him pretty quickly, and even though he makes her feel ashamed of her actions, she wants to help as much as she can. During the many months spent at Skullcup, we only see passing glances at her experiences. We see Felicen terrified of Beneth's dark moods, and doing anything she can to try avoiding them. Beneth getting her addicted to drugs to make her easier to control. Felicen accepting them because it makes the pain of her experiences seem farther away. Haboric continuing to shame Felicen and her lashing out and immediately regretting what she says, but never being able to voice her actual feelings and even her attempts at making Haboric laugh just further upset him. 
In case you don't understand what kind of relationship she has with Beneth, why do you think she was scared of his dark moods? She is desperate, trying to distract Beneth any way she can. We don't see it, but I think it's pretty clear that he abuses her, pretty often. Keep in mind as well that Bowden would absolutely know this is happening. We also see that Bowden and Haborik were making hidden plans, and despite her best efforts to keep them alive, she was being excluded. This betrayal from her proxy family broke her even more, and pushed her even further into the abusive clutches of Beneth, since at least he cared for her. The seed of hatred for her sister grows, and she gives in to her situation. She even learns to like the abuse she receives. It's a fairly common coping mechanism among the abused, since it allows them to regain a tiny modicum of power for themselves. The abuse from Beneth gets significantly worse. She is gang-raped by his men to earn loyalty, she's used as a gift while he bargains with the soldiers, she's beaten, and she's kept continuously drugged to keep her compliant. After a particularly bad beating, Haborik finds her passed out in an alleyway being left for dead. We see him caring, and we're like, wow, maybe he's actually going to help her. But then Felicent's first reaction after waking up is a panicked need to get back to her abuser. Again, this is a real thing that happens. Should she want to go back to Beneth? Absolutely not, but that's how most traumatic abuse victims think. Hearing this, Haborik stops trying to help her, and instead pushes her back towards Beneth since that's what she wants, quote-unquote. During the Whirlwind Uprising, Felicin is taken to Haborik, only to discover yet another betrayal. Haborik and Bowden had an escape plan, and were going to leave her behind. The people she had tried to help, who had been her proxy family for months, were going to abandon her in that hellhole. Want to know the reasons? From Haborik, until tonight, it seemed like you'd made Skull Cup your paradise. I didn't think you'd be interested in leaving. And Bowden later on says, Can't pull out a person who don't want to go. Yeah, okay, buddy. Felicin demands they bring Veneth, and Bowden heads out to find him. Heboric and Felicin get to the coast of Sinker's Lake when a swarm of frenzied bloodflies attacks them. Even though Felicin is incredibly upset at their betrayal, her first reaction is to try helping Haborik cover himself with mud and save him from the stings, instead of helping herself. Showing yet again how selfless she actually is when allowed to be. Because of this, however, she gets stung a lot. It's incredibly painful and leaves her face and body fairly disfigured. Malzahn's soldiers show up, and Captain Sawark allows them to escape since Felicin is there. From here on out, they've escaped Skullcup, but they are not safe yet. They must journey across the desert, and this is where Felsen starts to become really bitchy and show how much she hates the world. Interestingly enough, this is also where Felsen begins to be influenced by the Whirlwind Goddess, who is essentially the goddess of vitriol who wants all of humanity to die. She begins having dreams every night about a river of blood promising her power, and she is very happy about it. How much does this influence affect her attitude toward her travel companions? Hard to say, since she's pretty well justified to say shitty things to them. They are the only family that she has at this point, and they were both going to leave her at a slave camp since they thought she loved being there. Plus, Bowden bragged about killing her lover just to rub it in her face. Would you be nice to the people who tried to abandon you? Unfortunately, as time goes on, she is being affected by withdrawal, after effects of abuse, and her hatred of Tavor being the only thing keeping her going. She gradually becomes more and more of an asshole, pushing Haborik and Bowden further away. One of the arguments that I often see which kind of frustrates me is, oh, she's a bitch to the people who are only trying to help her. And this is frustrating to me, since I don't understand how you can pay attention to her sections and feel that way. We see Haborik trying to help her once, which was very nice, but when she wasn't immediately grateful, he pushes her back to her abuser. They were both going to abandon her to a short life of slavery and abuse. That was before she was mean to them all the time. Quite frankly, I wouldn't be nice to my supposed friends if they were going to leave me in a slave camp to die, so why would I expect Felicin to be nice after this? Their escape through the desert becomes very fraught. All three are weakening, though Haborik is the most affected. 
After one particularly bad day, Haboric passes out, and Bowden wants to give him extra water. This angers Felicin, as she believes he will die soon, and it would be a waste to give Haboric water when they aren't sure that they can even make it out of the desert. This is shitty of Felicin, but she's not necessarily wrong. Desperate circumstances and all that. During the heated conversation, Bowden brags about how Beneth never cared for her, was a liar, and hadn't actually been giving them extra food. That was due to Bowden working for the guards. The stuff about Beneth is true, but he says this knowing that it would hurt Felicin, as evidenced by the shitting grin on his face while he says it. All of this leads to Felicin attempting to kill Bowden. It looks like they won't make it out of the desert, so she wants to take revenge on him personally. She seduces him, then tries stabbing him after he passes out, when, surprise, he was faking it and nude the entire time. After stopping and disarming Felicin, he pins her down to let her know that he knew her plans, and then threatens to rape her up the ass. Here, we see what her response to rape is. She feels an immediate surge of terror, then rationalizes it with the thought, It's just more of the same. I can survive it. I can even enjoy it if I try. This only further proves that she was responding with a coping mechanism to deal with being raped in Skull Cup as well. Oddly enough, Bowden seems to be a lot nicer to her after she tries to kill him. Maybe he respected her more? He even starts actually living up to the job he was supposed to do, shielding her from flames on the ship when they were going through the Warren of Thier. Unfortunately, Felicin just gets worse. Finding out that Bowden was actually hired by her sister to protect her, she kicks him out of the group. She is not ready to accept that her sister may have tried helping her, it would destroy the hatred that she felt inside, which was the only thing keeping her going. Fortunately, Bowden follows the group after he leaves, so that when they are attacked by Grillin, he comes in and is able to save Felicin, though getting mortally wounded in the process. It's quite an intense scene, Grillin bursting into thousands upon thousands of rats, Mesrem the giant bear attacking, Culp being swarmed and eaten to the bone within seconds, the booming voice of Grillin sounding inside Felicin's head, and then Bowden is there snapping Felicin out of her shock and telling her to run. He has oil lanterns and proceeds to smash them, lighting huge swaths of rats on fire. Just fantastic. It is slightly important to note that he was not expecting to die. He believed he was fireproof due to the magical bronzing of his skin. I don't feel that this takes away from a sacrifice at all, though. To me, this whole part is an excellent redemption of Bowden and of Felicin herself. She hates this man, but there's still the attachment of shared hardships there. He shows up as a husk after the fight, burnt all over, unable to see, and very close to death. He collapses, and Felicin cradles his head in her lap. She doesn't let him die alone, she doesn't say anything mean, she just offers him some comfort as he passes, and she feels the armor that she's built up around herself cracking. It's a tender and tragic moment that breaks my heart every time. The scene ends with an important line. Armor can hide anything until the moment it falls away. Even a child. Especially a child. Traveling on, she eventually gives herself to the whirlwind goddess, believing it to be her best chance at getting revenge on her sister. After all, the adjunct would be coming to give answer to the apocalypse. Before that, we get one more view of Felsen's mind with the thought, Grief rapes the mind, and I know all about rape. It's a question of acquiescence, so I shall feel nothing. No rape, no grief. It shows us why she's willing to be able to be used by the goddess, allowing herself to be controlled. She doesn't see it as a huge loss, since she's able to make herself feel nothing. Even after being controlled, we can see her kindness one more time, as she adopts all of the orphans at the Oasis, one last glimpse of the broken child known as Felicin before she surrenders to the goddess. Okay, to summarize events, we have a young, privileged girl who has her family taken away from her within a very short period of time. Parents are dead, brother is a traitor and possibly dead, and her sister betrays her and sells her into slavery. As a 14-year-old girl with no defenses, she has now become a slave who learns very quickly that the only way for her to stay alive in this new world is to sell her body. 
Throughout her time as a slave, she gains two companions, a thug named Bowden and an old ex-priest named Haborik. She begins to see them as a new family through shared hardships. She uses her prostitution not just for herself, but also to help keep old Haborik alive, absolutely saving his life. She enters into an abusive relationship with a manipulative man named Beneth, who proceeds to get her addicted to drugs to force her to be gang-raped and used as a gift to buy loyalty. What do her two companions do about this? Well, nothing except to shame and belittle her every chance they get. She also finds out that these two companions were planning something in secret without her, which eviscerates her feelings. On the night of the rebellion, we discovered that these secret plans were an escape attempt that they were going to leave Felison behind without even saying goodbye. It's only because she catches them in the act that they take her along, so yeah, she's understandably pissed off at them. Everything horrible that is happening to her is caused by betrayal, and here are her only two friends in the middle of trying to betray her. They were going to leave a 15-year-old abuse victim behind because it seemed like she loved being raped so much, and yet, readers blame Felison for saying mean things to them? That's ridiculous. Especially since we see her internal monologue and how much she hates herself for saying those mean things. We know that she did not enjoy being raped. As is common among abuse victims, she devalued sex and herself in order to feel like what was happening to her wasn't a big deal. Contrary to some readers' opinions, she is not being mean to the two guys who saved her. She is being mean to the men who shamed her for being abused and who tried to abandon a 15-year-old girl to die a horrible death in a slave camp. Yes, She's not a very likable character, but my god, she does not deserve the hate that she gets, and to pretend that she does is absurd. I mean, in many respects, I'm, I'm uh, probably as proud of the portrayal of Felicin, uh, especially in Dead House Gates and in, and in House of Chains, mm -hmm. as I am of any character I've written. And again, I, I, I had a sense in writing her that I was as being as controlled as possible, that everything was under control and what I was going to let out was going to be uh, authentic and real. And what she was going to hold inside, again, was going to be authentic. But everybody else will only act on and think about her on the basis of what she shows them, even though what she shows them may be entirely false in terms of emotions. Right, right. So, I mean, she's, she's, a, she's a broken, traumatized character. And I think what constantly astonishes me is the sheer lack of sympathy I get from readers regarding Felicity. You know, they end up hating her. And it just, it blows my mind because this is, this is a, a, young, a young girl attempting to survive mm -hmm. in a very, very brutal and harsh world. Mm -hmm. And it's going to leave scars and it's going to, it's, it's going to, twist and alter her her view of what that world is right um and the loss of trust is is, is where it all starts uh, regarding her sister tavor i want to give you my favorite quote about compassion in the entire series it's spoken during memories of ice but it's not a plot spoiler we humans do not understand compassion in each moment of our lives we betray it i we know its worth yet in knowing we attach to it a value we guard the giving of it, believing it must be earned. Compassion is priceless in the truest sense of the word. It must be given freely, in abundance. I want to clarify again that all three of these characters are broken in some way, and I am not blaming any of them for how they reacted to each other. They're written very believably. It is all just so unfortunate for all of them. Haborik is a cynical old man who had accepted his fate, seeming to give up on the world. Bowden is a man who has lived an incredibly difficult and secretive life, and you know all about Felicin's problems. To expect them to have the right answers about trauma, or to make all the correct decisions, would be absurd. I'm also not trying to tell you who to like. Obviously, Felicin is pretty unlikable herself. I'm simply asking for you to show some compassion for someone you may not think deserves it. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me rant about the tragedy of Felis and Peran. Did I make you realize something new, or change your mind at all? Are you still interested in talking about this? Well, please leave a comment below and I'll try to get back to you.
Also, if you're interested in hearing about what I think of Felicen's journey and actions throughout House of Chains, let me know. Hope you all have a good day.